Hello, and welcome to Zim Explorer. I am Dr. Abstract. And in this Explorer, we're going to take a look at the second part of our shooting game, where we had some drones. And uh, we were looking through that on CodePen. So let's go to CodePen now, codepen.io. And then we found a Dan Zen, and if you go to Dan Zen and look at the public code pens of Dan Zen, you can find this one called Peace, Silence the Droning. Um, just in case you have arrived at this one and haven't seen the first part uh, of this, let's run this once with the sound on. So we'll turn the sound on here, and I'm pressing. We have silence, but as soon as a drone comes, we don't have silence, and we shoot. What we're trying to do is get rid of those drones as fast as we can so that we end up having some silence, which I don't have yet. There, did you hear that little moment of silence? Uh, oh, darn. Well, we had a moment of silence. Okay, that's enough. So, uh, there, that's silent. All we have to do is turn off the sound. Yay. And if the drones all come in there, then it goes red and you start losing points. So that's how, how this game works. If you want to find out how we're building this game, I would highly recommend, and you haven't seen the first part, I would recommend you see the first part. Right now we're about halfway through. I suspect it's going to be a two-parter. Well, I know it's at least a two-parter, but I suspect uh, that we won't go to a three-parter. That's the hopes. First one was almost yikes, it was 50 minutes. We're trying to keep these uh, explorers down to 30 minutes or so. That one went a bit overboard. I forgot about the, the parts. We could have done this in three parts, all like half an hour. Ah, oh. but you know, whatever. Hey, okay. So we got halfway down. Like I said, we had already talked about the tank, how it was made, how the copters were made, how the bullets were made, what the shooting was like how the motion controller worked, but we haven't done the hit test stuff yet. So let's have a look. Yeah, here's the shooting. And uh, we're shooting if these key codes, and the other thing we did that we didn't talk about last time is we stopped them from holding down the space bar. So it's possible, I'm just, I just commented out that, that check right there. And let's see what this would look like if we run it. I must silent that droning. So now I can, you see that? So what happens with key presses? It shoots once and then all of a sudden it just shoots a whole bunch like that. Um, so that, that lets you shoot really fast if you want, but if you hold it down, it's a bit ridiculous. And those are, that's a lot of assets too. We're running like for every single shoot we go, we're, we're running a sound and stuff. I don't even know if, if uh, computers, certainly not mobile devices, can handle something like 50 sounds all at the same time. So we put in a limit there. We basically are saying you're allowed to shoot, but when we key down, as long as, uh, oh, shoot check is true, let's see. So if not shoot check, so if we're not allowed to shoot check, it's going to return. And also the play check is uh, we don't let you shoot while those those messages are up, while the, well, the pains are up as well. So whenever we show a pain, like there's a pain right there, we cannot shoot right now. So we uh, have a, a play check as well that is being set at that later date. But anyway, we're saying, hey, as long as uh, if we bypass this, that means we can shoot. And then if we are hitting the right shoot key, so that's a space bar or the arrow up key, then we're going to the first thing that we do is set shoot to false. So you can't shoot anymore until when you frame, when you key up. So when you key up, it turns the shooting back to being allowed. So that's how we prevent you holding down the key and shooting forever. Uh, by the way, holding down a key, it has this built-in delay. You hold down the key, built-in delay, and then after that built-in delay, it goes really fast, almost like uh, at the speed of the computer in a sense, or speed, the speed of a, an interval, just or a request animation frame, probably. So, um, 
That's sometimes annoying. That's why the motion controller doesn't work in that way. It uh, basically attracts whether you've hit the key down and then it assumes you're moving. And when you hit that key back up again, it assumes you're not moving that way. That's different than hit the key down and then run the event every time that key, key is down because of that uh, awful lag in there. So if you see beginner games, they're quite often you hit the key, nothing it, it moves once, and then it, it, there's a stutter or a pause, and then all of a sudden it moves the way that you want. Um, that's not very uh, not a very good user experience. So uh, throughout our history of interactive media, it's always been that way, and we know how to deal with that. All right, and we put that dealing into the motion controller. Actually, we were talking about shooting, weren't we? We also put that dealing into the shooting, as we can probably, oh, well, we, we stopped them from holding down on that, so we avoided the, the issue altogether. We're showing our smoke, and we did take a look at the motion, or at the, uh, what's it called, a particle emitter, or the emitter there. And we shoot, we remove the score, but nowhere here are we actually, uh, well, we, we remove the score, but we don't let the score go less than zero. This is one way. Zim's also got this thing called a constraint, and you can just set the score equal to this constraint of the score and with the zero as a min, and you, would, you wouldn't even have to think about this. Uh, usually we use constraint for upper lower limits, just makes it a bit easier uh, for a single limit. It's almost, that, that's probably just as easy to run the single limit. And there's our key up. Okay, great. So uh, we were we also made the targets, and we just got started a bit, uh, talking about making the targets when we realized last time that we were a bit lengthy, so decided to split this in two. So here we are. That was a review. What we just did, all that stuff for the most part, and now we're making an interval where we're going to build our targets. Now. If we happen to run out of time and we were still running that interval, then we would run out of time over here. This thing on the left hand side would run out of time, and yet our targets would still be being created. So later on, when we end the game, we want to stop or pause this interval. Therefore, we're storing it in a variable. So const inter whatever is the result of this interval that that gives us a reference to the interval object so the zim interval is a little bit different than a, a normal javascript set interval uh, but it's similar you would store a set interval in a parameter as well but then you would say um, clear interval and in that whereas here this refers to the object we would say inter dot clear okay rather than clear interval and the id we this is the object and we say inter dot clear or that would clear it but inter dot pause is uh, we're wanting to pause it uh, javascript interval doesn't have a pause okay so it's one of the differences another difference is the javascript set interval you the number goes at the end so the number goes after the function with zim we've made it more consistent where you have hey run something for something and call the function just like click or you know uh, set or on an on method for a click call the function or a loop for this number call the function so um, we found that more consistent uh, to put the time first plus I would always forget the time how about you guys you know you, you go set interval you start writing the function that you got this great function you run it and you go oh I forgot that second parameter that last parameter there for how long so you always have to what I found is for set interval I would always try and make the structure of it first so I wouldn't forget that last parameter and then go in and start coding but it's kind of annoying here you set the interval you say hey how long and then you start working on the function <clears throat> this interval also has some some fun things like it can start right away if you so desire uh, I didn't want it to start right away because I wanted the uh, I wanted to get some points so by having silence at the beginning, it starts racking up your points. So it gives you some points to start. If the interval started right away, uh, to do that, by the way, I think it's, this is how many times it will run. So if you put 19, the interval would only run 19 times. So we want it to keep on running, but we want it to start right away. That's like that. Watch what happens. We run it. Uh, it started right away and the pause came after. 
That's interesting, huh? So there's another reason. We started that interval so quickly that uh, the pause of that interval didn't even kick in in time. Uh, the pause came up once we show this. Anyway, that's what happens. So uh, we, we definitely don't want to do that, I don't think. Get rid of that. And exploring. We're exploring. Now panning the sounds. That's one thing I, I didn't do initially and then thought, hey, we should pan the sounds is uh, quite a difference. I would say made a lot more fun because if you can hear the copter just arrived at the left, you go left immediately. So you could almost play this game with your, your eyes closed because of the panning. Every time a copter gets created, the sound is positioned at that copter in a sense. And here's what does that right here. So we take, so we're going to pan a couple things. Every time we fire a bullet, it pans the bullet. Um, every time there's an explosion, it, pan, it pans to where that explosion is. So we're passing in the object that we want to pan our sound to. And we take uh, here, uh, half, half the stage is here. So stage width divided by two is right in the middle. So if the object were over here, we take the distance of, of the object from the left-hand side. So this distance, say we're panning to this object right here. We would take this distance minus the stage width divided by two, gets this distance. And then we set, um, so what this is doing is it's going to give us a number between minus one and one. And we divide um, that number by the width of half of this, and that gets the percentage out of one, or well, not percentage, the ratio out of one. So if this is half, so the distance that was left over, say this is half right here, half the distance to here, um, we would end up half of one, positive one, positive one is this side, so we'd end up with a half, which means we'd pan at a half, which would be here. If it were over here, we'd be at minus a half and it would pan at minus half. If we were all here, it'd be minus one. If we were over on this side, it'd be at one. And if we're right here in the middle, it would be zero. Let's check it. Objects x would be stage width divided by two minus stage width divided by two is zero. So there we have no panning. It's like right in the center. Okay, so um, we call this function every time we run a sound. Shall we see a sound? Where's a sound? Here's a sound right here. So when we shoot, this is, oh uh, no, this is uh, what? Making the targets, animating target.sound. Why do we have a target.sound? Interval. Oh, uh, that's when we start bringing, oh yeah, right, the copter. The copter actually doesn't move left and right. It Well, it moves a touch, but basically once we make a copter, that's where we're positioning the copter sound. So the cop, this is the copter, it's been made. <clears throat> and then uh, we're taking the sound, the frame.asset right here. We're playing a random copter sound. So we recorded one sound and then we changed the pitch up and down in a sound program. So we changed the pitch just a little bit and then we're choosing one of those. So that's Zim random that gets us a whole number between one and three, including one and three. Rand's got all sorts of other things you can do to it too, but that's, uh, that's one thing. And then here we are playing, we're looping this backing sound and we're setting the pan to the results of the get pan passing in the target. So we saw that get pan um, sort of determines a number between negative one and one based on whatever target we pass in. And there we go. So that sets the, the pan of the playing. And that's kind of cool. Put your headphones on, you can really tell. Uh, what's neat with the, the bullets is as your as your tank goes across the bottom, it's really cool to hear the bullets go boo 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 and go like panned across the uh, the, the your sound. All right, here's the explosion emitter. So this was similar to the last emitter that we looked at. We've just made bigger circles and changed some of the parameters so that it happens in a different manner. And that makes the explosion on the copter. You want to see an explosion on the copter? There it is. So a little more gravity. And a little more gravity pulling that stuff down. And uh, if we made a big force here, like 10, which I think is the default, you'd be looking at um, a bigger explosion, obviously.
it would shoot it would shoot out more uh, mist. So there. It is. All right, so that's your force going out, and we decided that we didn't want it that big. And there's various other things you can set to. Again, this one start paused. Here's us setting up our new timer and our new scorer. The total time will be the time we set and the background color of orange on there. I think the background color is yellow by default, so we had to change the background color on that. Scaled it, set its alpha down a little bit to blend it in a touch and positioned it at 20, 20, 20, 20. When the timer's complete, we run end game. So there's an end game function. Here's the score. It's a new score. Background color of pink. Scaled it, set its alpha, and positioned it at 2020 from the right hand side. So there it is from the right hand side. Okay, and here we are doing our hit test. So we constantly have to find out if any of these bullets are hitting any of the targets. Oh, let's refresh that. So are any of the bullets hitting any of the targets? And we constantly check that. So we do that in a ticker. Now, processing has what's called a draw or something like that that constantly is drawing. And you just have a, a function called draw. And you put your anything that you constantly want to process in it. That's why it's called processing, because it gives you that kind of automatically. Here is the Zims version, which comes from CreateJS. It's a ticker. There's only one ticker, and we add functions to it. So there we are adding an arrow function to the ticker. We can add any number of functions that we want to the ticker. Indeed, when Zim animates, it adds functions to the ticker. When Zim does wiggle, it adds functions to the ticker. So there's other things in Zim as well that add functions to the ticker. The neat thing about it is the ticker runs each function then updates the stage. And another neat thing is you don't have to have a ticker. So there's many apps where you don't have a ticker and it's kind of like, well, yeah, processing, you know, you don't need that ticker. So why why do you, you have a ticker there? You're running a ticker possibly for no reason. Same with other, well, game engines usually. Games usually have uh, constant motion. So um, most game engines will have a ticker running as well. But that is what uh, would drain mobile, or one of the things that drains mobile is, is updating the stage constantly. And so we're a little bit careful of that. Uh, we have a ticker that makes sure that um, CreateJS, which is what this is based on, you run an animate, you have to make a ticker update that animate. You run another animation, somebody could make a second ticker updating that animation. Well, now you've got two tickers running when you really only need one. So we abstracted that and make it made it so there's only one ticker. You know you're not you're not going to get um, that issue of accidental uh, multiple updates. Anyway, on we go. We are um, if we're we're not playing, it doesn't bother checking. Otherwise, it's looping through the targets. And each time we receive a target, this is really nice with the arrow function. See that structure? We're looping through targets, which is the container of the of the of the copters. Each time we receive a copter, then we are looping through the projectiles, and each time we which is the container of of the bullets, and each time we receive a projectile, and we're testing to see if the target is hitting the rectangle of the projectile. The target is an unusual shape, so this will is the shape of the target hitting the rectangle around the projectile, which is the bullet. Um, this is one of the Zim hit tests, and it really is a hit test point, like it, it tests points four points on the corners of the rectangle and a point in the middle of the rectangle. And that will be fine for this hit test, I'm sure. You can actually specify how many points around the side you want. So if you did two or something, I mean, that I think that's uh, two uh, as well as the corners. So it does the corners always. You've also got two hit tests at the sides of the rectangle and two at the top of the rectangle and bottom of the rectangle. Okay. Um, 
that used to bog a little bit because you're testing against the shape here. But what we did way back, probably Zim 3 or 4 or something like that, we realized, oh, wait a minute, we should do a hit test on the bounds first. Because the bounds hit test is a hit test against two rectangles. It's calculation. It's really fast. So if those bounds aren't hitting, then don't even bother doing the complicated hit test. As soon as we did that, uh, our hit test no longer bogged ever. You know, it's like, oh my goodness, why didn't we think of that before? So um, that was a neat revel revelation, I guess. Uh, and, and it was a discovery. I, I and nobody told me that. Um, it was just a, a mind thought. It was like, wait a minute, what if we check the bounds first? Then we don't have to do this. And sure enough, that uh, that helped us. So. Uh, if we are hitting, then we're going to play the explosion sound and set the pan to the right place. We are stopping a sound. What's that? Oh, the target sound. Right, yeah. We want to stop the helicopter sound. We're locating the explosion. So we take that uh, particle emitter for the explosion. We locate it at the projectile and we spurt. That's a neat thing about loc. Loc, you can do X and Y here. So whatever the X is and the Y. Uh, although that would be more like a 70 or 22 comma 77. There we go. So that's X and Y location. But if you want to locate it at an object that has an X and Y, you can do it like so. Just say the object. At which point it says, oh, you've given me an object. I assume you want the X and Y of that object. And it handles uh, local to local issues as well. So even if they're in different containers, it will still put it visually at the same place. We remove the projectile, and we probably remove the target too, and target.stopAnimate. We stop the animation. I don't know, did we show you when the target was made? We didn't really look at it very closely. We're animating, and it's kind of cool. So here's us making the target. We talked about how the interval worked. But then we made a target equal to a new target, and that is from our uh, class. We have a target class up above. Basically, it's just a rectangle that has a weird corner to make it look like that. We position it, scaled it to zero. We animated the scale in. So here we're animating the scale in. Each time it will go to random scale between 1 and 1.5. So that's why these copters are slightly different sizes. We animate in in a slightly different amount of time. Sometimes they come in quickly, sometimes they come in more slowly. When they have animated in, we uh, call this function. And that function receives a target, which is whatever just got animated in. And then we're adjusting the registration point. Check this out. So we're adjusting the registration point. Can you see that? I'm trying to make that bigger for us. We're adjusting the registration point, nothing in the X. We're not changing the X registration. Right now, they're center regged. And then we're changing it to something up above, between random 100 and 400. This true on the reg says, do not change the visible location. Because whenever you change a registration point, it actually, the object will move. But we've uh, recently added, in the last couple of zims or something, uh, we've recently added a true or a parameter there that allows us to keep the apparent position, which is why these don't move when we do this. But the neat thing about having that registration point up there is we can wiggle them. So here we are wiggling the rotation about zero just a little bit in this amount of time. So this means uh, a minimum of two degrees and a minimum, a maximum of four between one and a half seconds and two seconds. We're also moving the Y up and down a little bit. So not very much, but just a little bit. And that's why we get uh, this coming up here. You'll see it. I think you'll see it. So it animates in, now it starts to wiggle. So because the registration points up here and we're rotating it, it makes it, uh, hang, I don't know, what do you want to call that? It makes it kind of, uh, <laughs> I think I called it a word in here. It's a good word, sway. That's it. Sway. <laughs> so they're swaying and moving up and down, and that gives those copters that kind of coptery looking motion. Great. Okay, well, sorry about that. <clears throat> so, We were taking a look at the hit test, though.
and we said uh, stop that animate as well. So target stop that animate. Uh, don't no longer do you need to sway because we've just removed you. There, I can't remember how it works with Zim. If you have something that is animating through Zim and it's looping, which which is what this is doing, or it's wiggling back and forth, uh, does it still do those calculations when you remove something from the stage? I don't think so. I think it gets away. But just in case, we stop animate on it and then we remove them from the stage. Okay, true, important. True. Do you see these? Do you know what those do? So those are uh, the third parameter of our loop, no, second parameter of our loop. So we have a loop and we're looping through that function. This happens to be the zim loop method. So it's sitting on targets, uh, which is a container. So that's a container. When you put the loop method, the zim loop method on a container, it will loop through the children. You can also run the zim loop function, which is loop, what was this called again? Targets, comma. So at that point, if you're running the zim function, you would put what you're looping through as the first parameter, or the first argument. And then you would have the function, and therefore the third parameter would be this true. But if it's a method, oops, uh, why? If it's a method, then you put the object first, and you don't need to specify the object you're looping through, obviously. OK. So the second parameter there then is true. That means loop backwards and loop backwards here. Anytime you remove something, and here we're removing both the target right here, target remove from and projectile remove from. If you're looping through containers that hold those, you have to loop backwards. Otherwise, the index numbers get, get, get mixed up, <laughs> like me. Um, even in a for loop, so this is traditional JavaScript for loop, same deal. You have to loop in a for loop backwards when you remove things. If you remove something from an array, then that array won't have the same index anymore. Or the, 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 the number of children in the thing you're looping through won't have this, the same, the index numbers uh, shift. So loop backwards and you don't run into a problem. Loop forwards, you run into a problem. You can't necessarily tell all the time there's a problem. It happens sometimes, depending on where the thing is that you're removing, and, and it's it's a really hard thing to debug. So get it into your head. Loop backwards when you remove an object. And we know that in Zim, so we put that parameter right there for you to loop backwards. Much easier than trying to remember a for loop going backwards. Okay, so um, then after we've done our looping, we're finding out, hey, if we've got no children, if the, all the targets are gone, then we're going to change our tank color. Uh, oh, and if our tank color is not already purple, there we are. See that? There we are checking the tank's color. And I think uh, if, you, if you saw the first part of this, um, of this explore, you saw that our tank object or tank class had a get a getter setter color property. And this is making use of that. We can find out what color the tank is. And if it's not purple, then set it to purple. Otherwise, what would happen in this loop, which is in a ticker, looping for everything that is made, every single thing that is made in a ticker, which is going 60 times per second, we would be setting the tank's color. So if we didn't check the tank's color, we are going and setting the tank's color is going into like five different rectangles and setting the color all the time for no reason. We don't we don't need to do that. So we do a check and say, hey, if the tank color like a conditional and if statement, this is this is fast, very fast. This is a property on an object, no problem. It's just like is x5, you know, no problem. So if the tank color is not purple, then we set it to purple. Otherwise, we don't bother setting it to purple because it already is purple, right? You get it? Woot woo! What an exploration. We increase our score. So uh, since it's going really fast, we actually increase that score quite quickly. That shouldn't really be plus one. This uh, we found that some of these things are are down here in the um, you know these these could tune the game. So let's adjust that. So score plus score. What would we call this? Um, score plus. And this one, we will say score minus. They could be different. They don't necessarily have to be both one. 
score minus, I guess at that point we could plus equal it and then have a minus thing. But okay, we'll, we'll keep them. Score plus, score minus. We go way up to the top then. And we're, oh, good score, darn. Well, anyway, we've got this other thing. Const score plus is equal to one. And const score minus is equal to one as well. And that gets subtracted. So um, in interval, oh, it's not an interval, in ticker when no, when silence, when there is silence, no drones. So we'll say added in ticker, um, removed in ticker when there are five drones, max target drones, when there are max target drones. Okay, so that will help people as they come into the game to kind of understand what those things are. Hopefully, I, it, you know, I did that live. I, <laughs> sometimes when you're, when you're on camera doing things, um, you don't think the straightest, but hopefully I did that okay. So where'd we get to? got to start thinking about finishing this thing up. Right, so we're, let's test that before we go too far. So there go the plus scores, that, that looks about decent, you see that? So that's the ticker going there, basically it took two, whatever, how many times that is. And we'll, we'll wait for a second until all the drones come in. And there we are removing the score because all the drones are in. And we have to try and get rid of some of those drones anyway so we don't lose lose score. Anyway, that's uh, that's what that stuff's doing in there. And then otherwise, so if it's, if, whoa, sorry about that. Code pen seems to do that or maybe it's a browser issue. So if we have no children, it's going to do this stuff. If we have maximum children, so if we're up to five, then it's going to do these ones. Else, set the tank color. If the tank color is not just the regular tank color, then set the tank color to the regular tank color. Because as soon as we shoot one of these things, let's shoot, boop, boop, boop. Now, now, oh, well, it's also finished. But um, now you can see the tank color goes to regular. All right, so that was the primary, that was the game. You've seen basically all of the game code. But then what happens quite often is you realize, oh, when the game is done, we got to reset. So there's a poor man's reset, and that is you can just reload the page. Reload the page looks like this. Uh, by the way, that would come in the, there's a start game, that would come in an end game right here. It would say, this is go uh, index, if this is an index.html is fine. If it is an index.html, that would do it. So that means just go to the same page, reload it. I don't mind that, but um, it is, like I said, a poor man's version of it. Usually you like to um, you like to keep the page loaded. And also for stats, it's a bit awkward if if you keep on increasing your stats every time somebody plays again. It's, it's good and bad. We have um, a stats called Wonder, Wonder at Zim. So Zim Wonder is a way to do micro stats and you can track anything you want, including how many times the game's gone. Uh, you could keep track of their scores. That they got. Anyway, um, so uh, that's aside the point. But here we did other things. We When the game is over, we pause the game. So we made a special function to pause the game. And we also created some end text, or we end is a pane, so that's a pane right there. There's the end text, your score is. We brought the score from the score. We also gave a little message. If the score is bigger than 500, which, which our zero score is not, uh, then we said shoo on the end. Otherwise, we said sigh on the end. So at the moment, you can see we're saying sigh on the end there. Now, the pane will close itself, or like when we click off it, it goes ahead and closes. 
let's take a look at the pane that we made. Our pane. So there's the intro pane right here. Intro pane. And must silence that droning is what it says, and we show it. But intro dot on close, that's when we're going to run start game. So that's how a pane works. You show the pane, and then you can capture a close event on the pane and do something. So here's the end pane right here. We don't really care what it says because we're going to change that message dynamically. But when we close, we call start game. So in both cases, whether we're starting the game from there or whether we're ending the game and we've seen a closing message, we're going to call the function start game. That's why we put it in a function because we're calling it from two different places. And then here's start game. Start game unpauses things. So how we begin in the first place is right here. Pause game, end game. Uh, I think we called start game. <laughs> yeah, that was another handy thing. Oh, we caused pause game, sorry. So there's pause game right away. So we've got this play check. Right now we're not playing uh, because we're at the start, so we've set the play check to false. But we're pausing the game. So pausing the game is right here saying pause animate stop all animation. So we set the animations going, but then we pause them right away. We also set the intervals going. We set the timer going. The timer is this guy on the top left. Um, we stopped all sounds. We The reason why we stopped all sounds is because if we're coming from the if we're pausing the game when we end the game, we need to stop the sounds. So that is a, a create JS way to stop all sounds. We also remove all the projectiles and set the play check to false. So this stuff happens at the very beginning. We don't need these things, but we call it, we're calling the same pause game function actually at the end of the game as well, when we want to pause at the end. So we threw those in, and that allows us to run all of those when we pause the game. So when we start the game, kind of similarly, when we start the game, even though the animations weren't, aren't even running, oh yeah, they might be actually, some animations might be running, the, maybe not, anyway, um, we pause them. We remove all the children, even though there might not be any children, because we're going to start the game at the end of the game as well. So a few of these things uh, wouldn't be necessary at the beginning, but there's no harm in removing all the children from the target, even if there aren't any children. Later, when there are children, you know, and we're starting again, then we'll need to remove those. I don't know if all that makes sense. Here's pausing. Uh, one of the things about that is when we start the game again, I wanted to give them that extra time, that time when the interval hasn't run. If we pause the interval at the end of the game, that interval could be paused halfway through. It could be paused just a little ways through. It could be paused almost at the end of the interval. And when we unpause it, when we set interval pause false, we'd only have a brief time left. So there'd only be like this little time, if, it, if it's already close to the interval, where you would get your plus points. That plus points, that, that helps you in the game. So what we do is we make sure to run that interval from the start. So that's what this parameter does. It says, oh, you're unpausing the interval. Do you want to actually unpause it, but run it from the beginning of the interval time? And that's what that does. It's there. It's there as a parameter in Zim because of this very reason. There are many times when, when you pause an interval and when you start it again, you actually don't want to start from exactly where it was paused in the interval scene, but you actually want to start it back again at, uh, at the beginning and give you yourself the full interval. So we're setting play check true at that point. I kind of I probably got you all mixed up. This is an exploration. I mean, I probably got you all mixed up going between the pause and the start and stuff. So you'll have to come in here and take a peek at this. But, you know, as we go, we're talking uh, about things, nuances of interactive media. We're starting the timer again, too. And we want the timer, if we just said timer.start, it would start at whatever number it already was at. So we want to start it and throw back in the total time again. That will start the timer again at, at 60 seconds, I think it was. And we're also putting the score, score back to zero. So that's all your start game stuff, pause game stuff, end game. What does the end game do? Pauses the game and shows the end game text and shows the end game message. 
and remember that end game message right here. It's going to show up when we close that, like right here. By clicking off, I'm going to close it. It'll run start game. Click off, run start game. So you see all that stuff? So it's from here. Whoa. To here. Just before the title. So all this stuff right here is what is needed. This type of thing is needed to pause and or to pause a game sometimes to um, restart a game. So that's not the poor man's version. That is the, uh, the the version that has a nice message. The version that doesn't refresh your page. You know, it's just a bit awkward sometimes. So um, there you go. Now Zim has things in it that makes this easy. It could be more difficult than this, but you see that it is a lot of steps, and it always is a lot of steps. It's not really, you know, a Zim issue. Zim actually helps you with doing this. It is that's how games are. Uh, they always have been. You, there's always a whole bunch of stuff that you need to do when you need to restart a game, and you have to keep track of it all. And blah blah blah. Alrighty, and we have a title piece. And we're centering it up above. We're animating that in, although there's really, you know, I don't know, does anybody see the animation in? Uh, when we, as soon as we added a message here, the animation in is, maybe we shouldn't even animate it in. Uh, but all these things could animate in. Maybe we want the message. As soon as we clear the message, these things slide in from the sides. The piece comes in from the bottom or fades in, you know, whatever. Uh, we didn't pay too much attention to that, but if you were doing a final production, you would want to make sure that you do. All right, does this seem good? I think we've hit the end there. Uh, as with all Zim code pens, we put a message to all of the, or we say what what is being used in there. Um, now you might look at that and go, oh my goodness, why, how, you know, why did you do that? Here's how we do that, by the way. We copy it, especially if you're educators. So there, I've, I've just copied everything. We go to the Zim Docs, and right up top here, there's this thing called Customize. Customize Docs with Feature Items. So we hit that, and we paste in here, like so, and we submit. What this does is it gives us a URL to the Docs. So if we were to copy this URL right here, copy and stick it up top. Now we get the docs with featured items. So there's all of those uh, feet, you know, these are all the items that were in there. There's the interval, a boundary, the loop, the wiggle, et cetera, et cetera, of uh, featured items. But the other thing that this gives us is uh, a list right here. So there's the list. It also gives us a list with breaks in front of it. And uh, we use those to fit right in here. There's the list. And under comments here, there's the um, the list with breaks because for some reason CodePen needs breaks put in otherwise it doesn't leave comments there. Cool, huh? Uh, this has been a an explore, um, a Zim explore with uh, Doctor Abstract. That is me. If you're into this, then you should come to zimjs.com and check out Zim, of course. Uh, also, zimjs.com slash slack, S-L-A-C-K. There's where you can ask all sorts of questions and post examples. Get involved in Zim if you so desire. We'd love to see you there. If, if you've made it this far, you've got to come to Slack. I mean, it's, it's a no-brainer. You're obviously interested in this. We'd be more than happy to help in anything you do there. So have a great night or day. Ciao. I'm Dr. Abstract. Bye-bye.